Hey, it's Kermit Weeks here at the EA Museum up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Standing in front of a de Havilland mosquito that I bought on my, I think it was my 30th birthday back in 1983 at the Strathallen uh, Museum auction. It was a Christie's auction up in Scotland. And uh, anyway, uh, airplanes uh, now over here in the United States. I uh, didn't get a chance to actually fly in it coming over, but uh, I did, uh, once it got over to Canada, I picked it up at the Canadian Warplane uh, Heritage Museum, got a chance to ride in it back with the British Aerospace Test Flight that flew it back uh, across the pond. His name was George Aird. He was the uh, mosquito pilot for British Aerospace and their mosquito. And uh, he seemed like the natural person to do the test line, to bring it across. I did get a chance in England to kind of swap seats one time on a test flight, got a chance to fly it a little bit. But uh, once we got it back, uh, I rode back from Canada down to the uh, uh, Weeks Air Museum in Miami, and uh, when we were coming in to land, he brought the throttles back, and about that time, to our surprise, out the left engine, there was a big puff of white smoke that came out of the, uh, it was actually steam, came out of the left uh, exhaust stacks over here, and uh, at that point, we went ahead and rolled out, shut the airplane down, and after whatever it was, a 5,000 mile journey across the, uh, uh, the Atlantic down to Florida, we towed it the last mile. So anyway, it turned out there was a impeller in the supercharger. It actually kind of disintegrated. One of the blades went through the aftercooler. And once we went below uh, ambient, which was like 30 inches of manifold pressure, it sucked four gallons of uh, coolant out the, uh, out the radiator, uh, out the exhaust stacks. Anyway, so um, uh, we sent the, uh, the parts out to get rebuilt out at Mike Nixon's shop. He eventually uh, sent the thing back. We fixed it and uh, George Edward came back from England. He actually did the uh, test flight. And then uh, surprisingly for me, uh, we, we went out on that test flight, went ahead and swapped seats, let me fly a little bit. He landed it, threw me in the left seat and off I went. It's a great airplane. Uh, and at some point uh, we will get it flying again. And we'll do a little bit of a walk around here and I'll show you the reason. Uh, why it's uh, uh, kind of still sitting here. I flew the airplane up to uh, the uh, Oshkosh uh, Air Venture Air Show back, I think it was about 1989, 1990, I believe was the last time the airplane uh, flew. And uh, I had actually been at one point to the Canadian Warplane Heritage Show, and I got a chance to do something that I don't know when the last time this was ever done. But we opened the air show with the Canadian Warplane Heritage Lancaster in the front. It was a Spitfire on one wing, a Hurricane on the other, and I was flying slot in the de Havilland Mosquito. So, and guess who was singing the national anthem, Canadian national anthem? Vera Lynn. She was the one that sang White Cliffs of Dover in World War II. So that was a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool opportunity. Uh, brought the airplane up here in uh, 1989 or 1990. I can't remember what it was. It was the year they had the Kuwaiti. Uh, war kind of broke out and I left the airplane here. I went home and uh, was uh, the intent was to bring it back. Uh, you know, I was going to fly back, take it to some military air shows that we had scheduled. And what ultimately happened was the war broke out. They canceled all the military air shows and I left it here. Well, another year went by, I got distracted. Another year needed some work. And ultimately the hurricane hit uh, in uh, 1992 couple of years later and then we were distracted for a long time so anyway the airplane uh, needs a little bit of TLC now and what's going to happen is um, we're currently working on my Lockheed Vega which is actually I think it's about 70 years old now would have been you know, about 1930 1931 kind of an airplane it's an all wood airplane just like this airplane is and uh, what we learn on the Lockheed Vega, which is similar construction, same kind of a fuselage, wooden wings and everything. Once we figure out what we can learn on the older glue and the older wood in the Vega, we will apply to this thing. Some skins I think need to come off at this point. This airplane's uh, at least 60 years old, maybe 70. I'm trying to think, uh, 1931, 70. It's 80 years old for the Vega, 70 years old for this airplane. You know, it just doesn't make sense to really go fly the airplane uh, uh, right now uh, in this kind of condition. It does need to be recovered and uh, we'll do a little bit of a walk around. Uh, the wings and all that I think look uh, 
look pretty good. Like I said, the whole thing's covered with fabric other than the metal parts, which are basically the little nacelle around the engine. Uh, all of the, uh, the engine parts are, are metal. And then, of course, up by the, where the radiator is, up in here, that's all metal. Everything else is basically wood, and it's a plywood outside. It's got a plywood inside with a balsa wood core. Uh, all the wing is basically uh, made in that uh, construction technique. The, uh, the landing gear on these things uh, take a long time to come up and go down and it's kind of like hanging your laundry out. There's a lot of drag on these things. Uh, there's a hydraulic pump on each engine. If you lose one of them, it takes twice as long to get the gear up and down. So it's something a pilot's got to be really conscientious of. If he loses an engine, he's got to make a landing. I want to point out something right here. This is a unique aspect to the, uh, the, the Haviland Mosquito. And I don't have a screwdriver right here. But this opens up and there's a primer. And uh, guess what? The pilot and a mosquito, at least my mosquito, can't start the airplane by himself. There are no priming switches inside the uh, cockpit, either manual where you, uh, you know, just squirt the engine uh, or if they are electric boost pumps. And uh, this one just has a little manual primer so you just pull it out, sucks the fuel in, pushes it in, and while the, end, the pilot up here is actually starting the engine, there's a mechanic out here that's actually squirting this, and guess what? Guess where he's standing? That's right. He's singeing his hair off while the uh, pilot's starting to uh, start the engine. I think this was a, a British carryover men uh, the mentality from the surf and kingdom days. You know, there was lots of surfs around. They were in the military. You know, the pilot had his white gloves on. You know, it was okay to lose a couple of surfs out there starting the engine. But anyway, whatever. It's got Hamilton standard uh, hydromatic props. They're aluminum. Um, trying to think what else. That's actually a tie down, but this is also a place where you can actually put a thing there. You can actually jack the airplane up. Uh, we found some uh, original uh, drop tanks that we actually brought. Uh, they're steel. Uh, we used to bring it over from uh, England. Um, of course, they can be on or off the airplane. I just decided to go ahead and leave them on when we brought it up here. Uh, the ailerons are aluminum. All that stuff's pretty good, but you know, when we when we restore the airplane, uh, when we take it home, uh, we're going to go ahead and take all that stuff apart. Uh, this is all wood, fabric covered. Um, you know, there's some places on the airplane that uh, you can see the fabric and the paint here just needs a lot of TLC. It would have been a, a you know, a natural cotton type fabric that would have been over here and the airplane has probably not been it wasn't recovered when I got the airplane in uh, 1983 uh, you can see how the fabric it just all needs to come off most of the paint and stuff's not doing too bad but uh, you can see little spots here where you know it's starting to craze and the paint and you know, the fabric needs to come off and you know when I see stuff like this uh, it just makes sense to actually probably pull some skins off and, uh, you know, here's a, here's a patch from some reason. You know, we'll drill all this apart uh, and go ahead and, and replace that skin there. I don't know what, you know, what was happening here. I'm sure it wasn't a bullet hole. Uh, this airplane was actually used in uh, Mosquito Squadron and 633 Squadron, the two Cliff Robertson films, but uh, it wasn't actually flying at the time. It was just used as a, a ground airplane that was taxing. That's my understanding. You can actually see where the paint's all faded. Um, anyway, so that's kind of, that's basically, you know, like I said, this all needs to be recovered. Uh, the fuselage was actually made in two halves. They would, the airplane is actually this half, uh, and then there's the other half over there, and they would actually make the two halves. They would put all the, uh, the accessories and all the equipment, everything in both halves, and then they would actually glue it together. I believe there's some sort of a little top skin up here as well. I don't know if you can actually see inside here. Well, let's see what we got in here. I got a little, uh... there we go. So we got some chalks. We got a spare tail wheel. There's uh, some balance weight right there that uh, was added for some kind of balance. Uh, jack P. 
pins right there. Let's look in the back here. Get up inside. There we go. So we got some uh, we got some balance weight. Those are lead things right there. And there's obviously some more right there for balance. Those look like uh, recognition lights. Um, there's a little hatch right there, which obviously goes back in that little tailwheel section there. So you got all the control cables, you know, running back here. Um, and you can kind of see where the, yeah, there is that, see that little strip that's on the inside. And that was basically where they would glue the two plywood halves together. Spare, uh, pickets, which I believe in British translation would be tie downs for the ground. Yeah, so that little door right there with a little felt right there obviously goes back in that hole there where the tailwheel is. And you know, on a dirty field, you'd probably get some, uh, dirt and mud going back there so yeah, it's pretty simple and sparse inside there there's uh you know there's some hydraulics going back there probably to i think the tailwheel stays down on this i don't think it i can't remember it probably maybe goes up and down yeah so there's a little strip right there for gluing the the bottom half and you got the weights uh, I don't know what would have gone in that round spot, but it could have been anything. Right now, it looks like there's a little vent, probably for the battery, which, yeah, would go right here. So there you got your, uh, what do you call it, the uh, baking soda. So a little filter, the battery would sit right here, which is obviously out. It goes in somewhere around here, and uh, that would clip right in there, 24-volt battery. Oh, there's the battery would hook up right up there. So anyway... Uh, there's a, a bob weight for the elevator, so if you pull G's, actually, it would, I don't know if that uh, uh, would make it easier uh, to pull or it would actually be less. Uh, it depends, uh, you know, anyway, rations, uh, probably, you know, Oreo cookies, possibly, uh, what would the British use, one of those things. Oh, they would probably have scones there. Anyway, um, our, all sorts of little electrical things. Uh, the battery uh, compartment there is all painted black, probably with some sort of acid-proof thing. <laughs> Smells uh, like a British mosquito in here. There you go. So there's a little bit of some modern radio right there for something and a lot of original stuff. But it's pretty basic in here, you know. So I think the wood here is probably... Uh, I don't know what exactly that is. Hydraulic uh, tank right there. What do we got here? Um, that is one gallon of something. I don't know what it is. Some of this could have been like anti-ice and stuff. There's the air bottle. This is all looks like uh, either hydraulics or probably pneumatics actually. So anyway, so that's up inside here. That's what we got pretty cool and let's walk this up and I got to tell you you can't tell here uh, you can't really tell here uh, on the video but a de Havilland mosquito has a particular smell to it and I, I, I can't really say I've smelled another de Havilland mosquito but this one has a very peculiar smell to it and I can assume it only has to do with the wood and all that stuff